Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today, I'm joined by two special guests, Drs. David Robenheimer and Dr. Stephen Simpson. And they are basically bug biologists uh, in Australia. And as we talk about, it's pretty remarkable that these two bug biologists throughout their career have made some amazing discoveries that apply to the basis of human nutrition. And what I mean by that is they discovered the prote protein leverage. And as we talk about the protein leverage hypothesis, that we are basically genetically hardwired to eat enough food until we reach a protein target. But here's what's interesting. As we talk about in this interview, the protein target isn't always the same. It changes with age, and it can change also with environment, and we can change it ourselves sort of based on our goals and our lifestyle. And the, the, the basis of this, this hypothesis or this biological finding of protein leverage is that too little protein is a bad thing, right? In the sense that it's going to stimulate us to overeat calories to get enough protein. But does that mean that more protein is always better? Well, uh, Steve and David, as you'll hear, think that more protein is not necessarily better. And they're pretty big advocates that too much protein leads to lower longevity. That's what they found in a lot of their, their bug data, uh, whether it was locusts and also in their rodent data with mice. But the question that I have is how does that then apply to humans? Humans are in a different environment, right? If we have insulin resistance and we're obese and we're living in a world where we're stimulated by constant food supply, we need to find a way to eat that's going to appease our appetite, lower our hunger, and benefit our metabolic health. And protein plays a big role for that. So how do you take that and balance it against um, some of this observational data and animal, animal data that suggests too much protein is bad for longevity? Very interesting question that doesn't have an easy answer. And I think, I think part of the problem is we try to just put it in the bucket, protein's bad for longevity, eat less, and therefore you'll live longer, end of story. And it's not so clear. And, and so we sort of get into that discussion. And although we may not agree on all points, I really appreciate their approach. They, they're very thoughtful. They, they know the science well, and they understand that things change over time. But, but the, the, the overall nature of this discussion is about protein leverage, how it applies to us as humans and how is it related to the obesity epidemic and what can we do about it? How can we take this knowledge of biology, apply it to our environment and our everyday life to try and be healthier, both as individuals and as a society? Um, and so you can see, um, as we discussed, we talk a lot about their book, Eat Like the Animals. I'm a big fan of this book. I highly recommend it. I don't usually push um, books necessarily uh, on this podcast, but I think this one is worth reading. And they also have another one called Nature of Nutrition, which I have to admit I, uh, I haven't read, but I will definitely go out and get them because I'm a big fan of the two professors. So uh, enough of that introduction. I hope you enjoy this podcast uh, talking about protein leverage. Doctors Robenheimer and Simpson, thank you so much for joining me today on the Diet Doctor podcast. It's a pleasure, Brett. It's a pleasure. You're uh, you're coming in all the way from Australia. I don't think we could really get much further apart with me being in California and you being in Australia. But it is wonderful that we're able to make the time for this. And I'm such a big fan of your work about with the protein leverage hypothesis and what this means for for us humans. But I remember reading something that that you wrote that people were shocked that two bug scientists created something or discovered something that was so pertinent to human nutrition. And it was almost like it was almost like an insult that the human nutritionists and the people studying all this had, had missed something that two bug scientists came up with. And you were sort of self-deprecating, I think, as as you described that. But tell us a little bit if you can summarize in, I know it's such a big topic, but in a couple of minutes, summarize the protein leverage hypothesis and how it sort of came to be that you found it. Well, no, you're exactly right, Brett. Uh, and there's a story we recount in the book. Um, I gave a, a talk in at Cambridge University in 2005, soon after the publication of the original protein leverage hypothesis paper, where a, a very eminent colleague um, came up to me afterwards and, and said exactly what you said. He, he, he also admitted to having sat on uh, the review of the paper for more than six months because he was he was so affronted that two bug scientists had come up with something um, that he and others in the field feel they should have noticed. And um, he, he said very generously at the time, um, I hope you understand that this is very difficult for us. Um, 
but I think you're right. So that was uh, that was one of those wonderful <laughs> occasions in in one's career where you've really pushed against the prevailing view of things. You've come in from an outside position, and yet um, you you have some sort of affirmation from a senior figure in the field. But it um, it stemmed back to the work that David and I did initially together in Oxford working on insects, working on locusts, an animal that um, we'd been studying and I'd started studying as a PhD student around appetite control. I I wanted to know why locusts eat when they eat and um, how much they eat and the understanding of the control of appetite was, was a really interesting problem, biologically very interesting. Um, and then emerging out of that early research um, came the realisation that, that locusts don't, aren't just hungry for anything, they're hungry for specific nutrients and demonstrating that there were specific nutrients for at least two of the macronutrients at that time, protein and carbohydrate. Um, and David arrived in Oxford and we started to work together on the, the notion of appetites competing with one another and it was emerging out of that early work that we discovered that um, indeed appetites can either work together to guide animals to optimal diet choices or in suboptimal nutritional environments, they're going to compete. And in our locust systems, um, protein won that competition. And really from there, everything followed. Yeah, we came into um, we came into into that research, into human nutrition research, as Steve said, from a very different perspective. We had the advantage of of being biologists and looking at the diversity in the natural world. And the obvious question that arose to us is, how is it that all these other species are so damn good at selecting a balanced diet, and and why does our species not do the same? So the research that Steve's speaking to was addressing the how do other species do this uh, question. And, of course, we found they have separate appetites that interact and work together to enable them to to balance their intake of nutrients in in an appropriate food environment. If if you go back to, um, let's say, Charles Darwin and his work on um, Galapagos finches, you know, a strange group of birds and a strange group of islands, but if you... If you look uh, in the right way at a a particular system, which may have nothing to do with humanity directly, you can come up with insights that actually can really profoundly change the way that you understand human biology. So for us, locusts were our Galapagos finches, if you like. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And and I like how you mentioned that you were outsiders. And, And frequently it takes an outsider without sort of the preconceived notions and biases to come in and shake up and, and discover things, which I think is exactly what you did. And your book is wonderful, how it goes through the whole process of, of starting with locusts and the nutritional geometry and how you waited anxiously for your results because it could have been months and months of work to find no results, but that each time you found that sweet spot that no matter what the locusts were eating, whether they were eating on their own or whether they were being fed certain diets, they kind of always gravitated towards the same amount of protein. Um, and so you talk about the different appetites and uh, there are actually, you mentioned that there are five appetites, but it seems like protein is key and there's protein, fat, carbs, sodium, and calcium. But I'm curious why you think protein rises to the top. Why is it that, that people will, or I guess the animals and presumably people as well, will prioritize protein over those other appetites? One really important um, answer to that is that we don't have a protein storage capacity like we do uh, a fat storage capacity. And that means two things. It means firstly that on a daily basis, we need to ensure that we satisfy our protein requirements. So we need to ensure that we get enough. The other thing that it means is that if we overeat protein, there's no opportunity to store it for the future. Now, fat and carbohydrates are very different in both of those respects, and that gives human biology less latitude over our protein intake than what it does over fat and carbohydrate intake. The other other critical thing, obviously, about protein is not only is it an energy-yielding nutrient, um, like fat and carbohydrate, the other two macronutrients, but it also contains nitrogen, and you need nitrogen 
to build just about everything. Um, you need reproduction requires um, nitrogen. So too does growth. So too does um, all the essential functions of cells and cellular maintenance require nitrogen um, in the form of proteins that ultimately come from the diet. Where, where unlike some other organisms in the world that can take atmospheric nitrogen and fix it and then use it to build their own nitrogenous tissues, we can't do that. We rely on it to come from our diet. So protein is the source, the principal source of nitrogen in our diet. Hence, it has this double um, importance um, and coupled to the fact that we don't store it in any large separate um, storage organ, that means that it really becomes of great priority to us. And the other interesting thing about it is that amongst the three macronutrients, it's actually the minor one in terms of contribution to energy. So 15, 20% of our diet comes, um, our calories in our diet comes in the form of protein. And yet it's also an essential macronutrient. And that combination gives it enormous leverage. And the, the, the leverage comes from the fact that if you want to get enough protein, you've got to eat a whole lot more or a whole lot less of everything else in the diet, depending on its concentration in the diet. And therein lies the, the heart of the protein leverage hypothesis. And here is what Steve has been saying, um, that it's also, of course, a dual purpose nutrient compared to fats and carbohydrates in the sense can be used for structure and metabolic functions, as well as in energy metabolism via gluconeogenesis, whereas, of course, um, fats and carbohydrates aren't that way. They don't have the nitrogen. Right. They're not the structural component in the muscle building and the bones and everything. Yep. So that does make sense why we would want to prioritize that. Now, it, it, you know, it is so interesting that um, that you showed so elegantly, if the locusts or the, the animals are fed a low protein diet, they will overeat calories to get the same amount of protein. And if they're fed a higher protein diet, they will under eat calories once they sort of reach that protein level. But now my next question is, why is it the protein leverage hypothesis? Why is it not the protein leverage proof or the protein leverage oh. um, you know, effect or something that implies more certainty? Because when you read protein leverage hypothesis, I think a lot of people's first thought is, well, it's just a hypothesis. It's not proven. What's the level of evidence? So, so tell me about that. Like, why, did you, why the word hypothesis and how strong do you think the evidence is to support it? So protein leverage itself is not a hypothesis. That's been demonstrated several times in independent labs, in randomized controlled trials. We now have population data indicating the same, reanalysis of literature data. Humans show protein leverage. The hypothesis is not around that. The hypothesis is around the role of protein leverage in driving the obesity epidemic. So it's an ecological hypothesis. It's not the biological hypothesis. Yeah, that's a really important point. So um, the demonstration that there's a separate protein appetite, um, that, that's incontrovertible now. And, and it is universal um, to the extent that every species that's been looked at demonstrates a separate protein appetite. That's the thing you require. That's the first thing you require for protein leverage to occur. The second is whether or not that protein appetite dominates and hence leads to protein leverage. And um, that isn't universal. Some species, as we demonstrate in the book, uh, actually show um, other forms of leverage where non-protein energy is prioritized over protein intake. But in our species and in a whole range of others that we've looked at, including some of our primate cousins, um, protein leverage does occur. So that's, I guess, incontrovertible as well. The question is, and the hypothesis, the only time we ever use that word is, as David said, in relation to whether that phenomenon um, has contributed to the obesity epidemic. And I would argue now that the evidence for that is, is near overwhelming as well. And it comes, as David says, from population level analysis, analysis of national survey data, um, clinical trials, experimental studies, um, smaller scale studies in the lab, um, meta-analyses of, of trials, et cetera, et cetera. It's now coming to the point, and we, we sort of brought 
the evidence together in 2019 most recently. I think you'd be brave to deny its existence now as a contributor to the obesity epidemic. Yeah, well, the, I guess the counter argument, though, is if you were to say it's the which you know the case you make so well in your book, it, the ultra processed foods, the the combination of carbs and fat devoid of protein, that we overeat those because we're trying to get to that certain level of protein. That it's our evolution pushing us to get that level of protein. Whereas it seems like maybe the critics would say, or maybe not even the critics, just some people would say, but in addition, those ultra processed foods stimulate uh, the reward center and and stimulate us to eat more. So is it does it have yeah. to be one or the other that maybe it's not the protein, maybe it's that they're being stimulated to eat more, or do you think it's just a combined effect? Very much a combined effect. Yeah. Both are true, but we have controlled for that in varying, in our randomized control trials, in varying in a systematic way in a non ultra processed food environment, the percentage of energy contributed to. Um, to, to non-processed uh, meals uh, from protein. So we've, we've done that experimentally, and it's not just the effect that you're mentioning. But the important fact, the effect that you're mentioning has to do with the interaction between two very important contributors to, to dietary intake. The one is what we choose to eat, and the other is how much of it we eat once we've chosen it. So ultra-processed foods, the effect you're mentioning, they feed into the first as well. They are what divert us from whole food diets because of the palatability of the mixtures that are produced industrially, and they're fine-tuned specifically to appeal to human uh, taste and, and um, hedonic responses. Um, and once we've chosen to eat a diet that is rich in low-protein, ultra-processed foods, protein leverage kicks in and ensures that we overeat fats and carbohydrates to stabilize protein intake. So that interaction between selection and how much we eat of what we've selected is a very important one. And, and picking up on that, um, and we, we, we looked at this ourselves, if you, if you actually measured the frequency of different foods in our food modern food environment and look at the extent to which we've been distracted or diverted away from our target protein intake, it's actually remarkably um, little in comparison with what it should be if you look at the superabundance of the ultra-processed, low-protein foods in our environment. To, to have only been diverted off course by you know, a couple of percent at most over the last 50 years towards a lower-protein intake in the diet is pretty remarkable and I think testament to um, the effectiveness of these regulatory appetite systems. But the problem comes from the fact, as we said earlier, that protein is the minor macronutrient. And if you dilute it by just a percent or two, you're driving a 10% or more increase in total calorie intake to get to the same protein intake. And that is the heart of the protein leverage effect. The other important thing is that there's huge variation within populations in the percentage and en energy contributed by ultra-processed foods to human diets. So in the United States, for example, we did an analysis. The average is 50%, and that's a huge amount for an average. But it goes right the way up to 80% um, uh, in, in, the, um, in the highest um, fifth group. 80% um, of the diet is contributed by energy is contributed by ultra processed foods, right down to 30%. So that's a huge variation. And actually, it tracks pretty well with what we know about the variation in, in obesity in relation to, to intake of ultra processed foods. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting answer. So, the, basically, what you were getting at is um, if the a percentage of protein has was supposed to be around 18%, I guess, is is kind of the, the magic number, it seems like, from, I don't know if you'd agree with that or not, from, from your book, but if it only goes down to 13%, that's a simple 5% difference, which on the surface may seem like no big deal, but the over the amount of calories you need to overeat to make that up is is related to how little protein is in your diet. So if you're in that 80% group, you could be eating... 50% or more calories to make it up for make up for that but if you're in a, the lower level of the ultra processed foods maybe it's fewer calories you need to overeat so the baseline diet really plays into that is that a sort of a fair statement no that's exactly right in fact if you go from 13 to 18% or the other way around 18 to 
uh, that would drive a, an, an enormous increase in calories to, to attain the same absolute intake of protein. Uh, and it doesn't require that big a difference. Actually, when we looked at nutrient supplies over the last sort of 50, 60 years, it, it's probably at a population level only a percent or two that there's been a dilution of protein in the food supply, um, yet that can drive still a 10% increase in total energy. It's, it's sort of basic Euclidean geometry. Um, and if you do the maths, you'll see how much leverage changing protein has on total intake. And of course, in the other direction, if you concentrate protein in your diet, because our regulatory systems don't allow us to overconsume it substantially either, then you'll end up um, eating fewer calories than you need, and that potentially could support weight loss. Right, right. So I definitely want to get into that. But when we're talking about the ultra-processed foods being devoid of, of protein and or being such a problem in our population, could a solution just be throw some whey protein, throw some pea protein into these uh, processed foods, and then we satisfy the protein leverage hypothesis, or is it more complicated than that? I think it's more complicated than that because it's not just, well, firstly, it's not a carbohydrate is not necessarily, all carbohydrates are not equal. So highly refined, these foods are made from highly refined um, carbohydrates, highly processed carbohydrates. Um, and the second thing is that it's not just the composition of the food, it's also the structure of the food that makes an important difference to the way that it interacts, our bodies interact with the food. So if you add powdered cellulose, powdered fiber to a diet, it's very different than eating a plant that has the structural component, uh, the fiber making up the structural component. Um, so it, it's a debate and some people think, particularly the food industry is confident that um, ultra-processed foods can be reformulated in a way that circumvents the problem, but it's a really complex challenge. And who knows, possibly technology in the future will enable that to be the case, but at the moment there's no evidence that it is. It's an interesting and, and still open question. Um, David's indicated there's a key element, which is fiber, dietary fiber, and hence overall caloric density of foods is uh, an important part of the, the story as well, because that ultimately is an important part of the regulatory systems that have evolved to control appetite. Um, but, you know, it, it is a fair question. If you were to um, do what we've done in our locusts and mouse studies is to essentially have an ultra-processed diet where you manipulate the proportions of, of components and you do get outcomes which um, can if you titrate the nutrients, lead you to be overweight and metabolically healthy, overweight and seriously unhealthy, underweight and metabolically unhealthy as well. So um, that's the power of nutritional geometry and it provides a way of thinking about uh, how you answer that sort of, exactly how you answer that sort of question, Brett. Yeah, I think that fits very well with um, with what you said in your book when you were studying the locusts, that the, the, uh, the locusts that ate that got their protein amount in fewer calories, so they were eating higher protein food, were thinner and, and almost yep. too thin to a point where they didn't start to fly until later. But those who had to overeat carbs, so to speak, to get that same protein amount were obese, obese locusts. But when you change the quality of the carbs, then it wasn't so much it had less of an effect on their overall health. So it's not just the amount of the food that they're eating, but the quality that they're eating as well. Does that sum it up right? No, that's exactly right. And we have published tomorrow um, a major study. It's a mouse study, the largest that we've ever undertaken. And as you probably understand, we're fool enough to do huge mouse studies like the one we report in the in the book. What we've done is, is to really explore the interaction between protein and carbohydrate, looking into not only the background level of protein in the diet for mice, but also the nature of the carbs. And the results are actually quite remarkable. So we've, we've <coughs> reaffirmed um, very strongly, and you know we've reaffirmed, but other labs have done the same, of course, that if you, as a middle-aged mouse, have a lower percent protein in the diet, then you live longer, particularly when that's coupled to high um, concentration of carbohydrates. 
What we found is that that beneficial effect of protein dilution in middle age and early late age is it's it's amplified if you have digestion resistance um, starches, in other words, really complex carbs in the diet, and it's totally abrogated if you have the equivalent of high fructose corn syrup as your principal carbohydrate. And that turned out, so we titrated glucose and fructose um, as monosaccharides together in different ratios at different protein backgrounds. We had sucrose, we had native wheat starch, which is digestible, and we had resistant starch. And you got the worst possible combination of outcomes if you had low protein and high um, um, fructose, glucose mixtures in a one-to-one ratio. That was the killer spot. Um, So a low-protein diet can either be profoundly healthy uh, if it's a complex carbohydrate that it's mixed with, low-carb, high-complex carbs, uh, uh, or or else it can be the worst if you're low-protein, driven to overconsume calories because it's low in protein by protein leverage and getting a bunch of one-to-one glucose, fructose um, monomers together in your diet. And that seems to be the sweet spot for bad outcomes. Which is exactly what we see if we look at global diets, the range in global diets, the healthiest diets associated with the, the longest health spans, like the Okinawan, traditional Okinawan Japanese diet, Mediterranean diet, and, and others, Kitavan Islanders, uh, all have that combination of low protein paired with complex starches compared to the processed food diet, which is low protein compared to highly refined carbohydrates. But doesn't that then fly in the face of protein leverage? If, if you know, the traditional Okinawans are reported to be eating or to have eaten 10% of their calories from protein. So that would suggest yep. they should be driven to massively overconsume the carbohydrates, even though they're higher quality, higher fiber carbohydrates, what, shouldn't they be eating, you know, three, four, five thousand calories a day to try and get a higher percentage of protein? So how do you equate those? Well, that's where you need to bring in the fiber components in the diet. So the principle um, that they, they have a highly dilute energy dilute diet um, overall, and as we explain in the book, one of the the best breaks on protein leverage is dietary fiber and um, the complexity of carbohydrate in the diet and the association with um, various types of dietary fiber is, we think, likely the outcome there. And that's precisely what the mouse study is indicating. So I I think talking about the traditional Okinawans, um, which unfortunately is obviously very different now in that environment, but it brings up the concept of what is the baseline we're starting with? So if you're talking about someone eating 80% of their calories from processed foods versus somebody eating you know, 5% of their calories from processed foods, it's a wildly different story. But the question is, does the, does the amount of protein still have to be basically the same between those two groups? And, and, and one of the reasons why I ask is, you know, people focus on the benefits of protein for muscle maintenance or the benefits of protein for metabolic health or for weight loss. So there are lots of elegant studies out there showing that higher protein diets up to 30, 35% compared to 20% can help with blood sugar control, can help with weight loss, which suggests that more protein is better in many ways, um, but not in all ways. So uh, how do you balance the the drive to get enough protein with some potential benefits to more protein and also some potential concerns to more protein. It sounds like, you know, we're trying to juggle too many balls to really come up with a conclusion. So give us your thoughts on that. Well, the word balance is crucial, I think, Brett. The idea that um, more protein is is good, therefore even more must be better, um, is flies in the face of of what nutritional geometry has demonstrated. And it's got a it's, it's axiomatic to everything that we've discovered that there's, there's a, an issue where things have to be traded off. There are costs and benefits. Too little is bad. Too much is bad. There's a balance. There's what we call the intake target is that sweet spot. Um, and that sweet spot will change. And that's something that isn't entirely um, as well appreciated as, as we think it should be. And it isn't reflected, for example, in national dietary guidelines, which 
assume the same diet quality across <coughs> the life course. So that's the first part to the answer. We've shown, um, and we do so in the book, that as you go through life, your protein targets and your non-protein energy mixture will change. And it will change, obviously, profoundly from the point where you enter the world and you're feeding on um, the, the perfect diet for you as a newborn is breast milk. It's only 7% protein, high in fat and carbs. And that combination is perfect for you as an infant, but it would be catastrophic for you in, in midlife. Um, but as you go through your um, adolescence and become an adult and, and, and go through your reproductive years, um, pregnancy, and if you're a woman, um, your protein needs will be higher. Um, but when you get past that into your late 30s and 40s, um, it, it, all the evidence that, that we've discovered both experimentally and, and at population level is indicating that reducing protein intake and increasing um, healthy carbs is going to have the, the, the best um, outcomes in terms of um, age-specific mortality and disease risk. So these things, and then when you get to your later years, you start to become really quite inefficient in the way you handle protein. So in your old age, you need to increase your protein um, intake again because your target has gone up. And if you don't, then you're going to suffer problems of sarcopenia and muscle wasting. So all of those things, that's, that's a really important component um, to the story, that our requirements change as we go through life and one size doesn't fit all. Now, you add to that, of course, um, differences in lifestyle. If you're a bodybuilder, if you're uh, an elite athlete, we give some examples in the book there, um, then your protein target is higher because you have a higher requirement for it. Um, so all, all of that is, is part of the, the answer um, to why protein levels may be required differently at different stages throughout one's life. Our interest isn't in advocating diets, but it's in understanding diets. And of course, diets are an individual choice as well. And if what you want out of your diet is 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 large muscle mass and the things associated with very high protein diets, that's an important thing to take into consideration, but really important also to be aware that in the longer term, there might be health and metabolic um, consequences to that, as our research shows in relation to the re reduction in lifespan and health span associated with um, high-protein midlife diets. And I think picking, picking up on it, there's another really crucial distinction that's worth drawing, and it speaks to the point you made about increasing protein in the diet may be good for weight loss and, and for resetting blood sugars. Now, now, that's clearly the case, and we understand why, and protein leverage explains part of the reason why. Um, but there's an it's important to make a distinction between a therapeutic dietary intervention and a habitual population healthy diet. And sometimes we feel that is getting a little bit confused. And maybe um, an example would be, um, you know, a defibrillator is a very useful device if you're um, suffering a cardiac arrest, but you wouldn't use it as part of your normal healthy heart regime. Um, so distinguishing therapeutic from habitual healthy lifestyle diets, having um, remediated the problem through a dietary intervention, we need to be a little bit more sophisticated, I think, in thinking about those things. You know, there's costs and benefits. Um, the benefit from a, a higher protein diet in terms of weight loss and metabolic um, resetting um, is unanswerable, <laughs> but only um, it's only worth paying the costs if you need to do those things. Um, otherwise, you're unnecessarily um, remediating a problem that isn't there and just getting, getting the downside, which is the cost that come with uh, a higher than optimal, higher than target protein intake. Yeah, it's very important points that, that it, as age changes, protein requirements changes, and as health conditions changes, protein requirements right. change. And to, to make a dietary guideline for everybody just seems a little absurd and, and unhelpful. So I think that was well said. Yeah, yeah. But you also brought up the, the terms lifespan and health span, which I think are so important to, mm. to differentiate. And so one of the important points you brought up in your book was those who had 
the the um, the locusts, the bugs that had that ate fewer. I've, I'm having a hard time specifying the <laughs> bugs because I'm so used to talking about humans. But the locusts that ate less protein lived longer, but ha- seemed to have less reproductive health. And those that ate yes. more protein had more reproductive health and lived longer. Now, to to my sort of simplistic uh, thinking of this, to me that votes for a greater health span or greater health if you look at reproductive health as a marker of the bug's overall health at the cost of longer lifespan, which if you translate to to humans um, could be really important because as we talk about lengthening life, what kind of life life are we lengthening? Are we lengthening sort of frail and weak life or more vibrant and healthy life? So when, when when I talk about reproductive health as a marker of overall health. Does that, does that make sense or do you, do you see it a different way? Evolutionary theory, the trade-offs are really important in evolutionary thinking and evolutionary theory. And, and the trade-off between lifespan and reproduction is, is a good example of that in, in life history theory. And, and the idea there is that um, it's, if reproduction, the, the goal of a species is to reproduce because that's how evolutionary adaptations take place, passing on genes into future generations. But that's dependent on the environment's capacity to support reproduction. So the theory is that in periods when uh, the key nutrient for reproduction protein is available, then species will and individuals will reproduce that will take advantage of the environment and reproduce and and reproduction comes with its costs those costs aren't fully understood part of them arise from the evolutionary dynamics that once you have reproduced natural selection on your bodily adaptations is reduced in proportion to the extent to which your genes are out there in the population. So if you think, for example, if an individual reproduces early and passes on cancer genes, um, uh, then those cancer genes are already out in the population. Um, So uh, uh, evolution is reduced uh, according to reproduction. The theory is that in periods when protein is not abundantly available in the environment, then what the body does is it it adopts a different set of metabolic pathways that slows down progression through the the lifespan. And that's associated not with the go um, uh, pathway, but it's this go slow pathway to do with um, repair and maintenance of uh, metabolic um, processes within the body. And it's that that is believed to extend lifespan on low protein diets so you sit it down and mm. and hunker hunker down until the world gets better and then when you get the opportunity then reproduce so it leads to this sort of trade-off between the two as to what matters most um I, there's a lovely example we we give in the book where our first big study where we looked at what are the costs to eating different ratios of protein and carbs in the case of uh, drosophila the little um, vinegar fly, the fruit fly, the so beloved of geneticists for for decades. So we used we did an experiment. We provided twenty eight different mixtures of protein and carbs and different concentrations, and we measured how much the flies ate, how many eggs they laid, and how long they lived, and then mapped those response landscapes um, and showed that if they're on a lower protein, high carb diet, they lived longest. But if they're on a higher protein, low carb diet, they had they laid more eggs. Uh, if you went to a really high protein diet, they neither lived longer nor laid many eggs. So there was there, there were different sweet spots. Then we asked the flies the question: What do you care about? Uh, what what's your primary goal in life? Is it to live long or to <coughs> lay as many eggs as you can? And to do that, we gave them different diet choices to allow them to make their own selection. Uh, lo and behold, they chose the diet that maximised their reproduction, not how long they lived. Um, so Darwin was right again. Um, now, when it comes to us, that's a, perhaps a different. Um, it's a different formulation. How? What do we care about? Um, I'd, I'd argue we care about um, living healthily. Um, and not living with with um, profound illnesses of frailty into our um, really advanced age, but to live as healthily for as long as we can. So this is the notion of health span hmm. versus lifespan, minimising 
uh, the numbers of years that you're alive but unable to to really enjoy being alive. Right, and that's where I think it becomes a little challenging to really set that protein target again for a population. Very difficult to do, uh, but even for individuals, depending on if they want to prioritize being more vibrant and healthy and active and energetic, and they're going to need a yeah. little bit more protein versus someone who maybe doesn't emphasize that as much, and they're going to need a little less protein. But does that yeah. that sort of goes beyond the protein leverage then? Because it seems like protein leverage um, is almost like a set point, but does that does the protein leverage also change based on your baseline activities and your physical activity? And uh, do you have to choose to eat more or do you think you would also be sort of evolutionarily stimulated to eat more protein as well, the more active you are? Well, your, your protein target changes over the life course and leverage is with respect to your target. So that's the first thing. It's not a, a fixed set point across the life. It's relative to your protein target and that will change. Um, now, the question is, it will change throughout your life course as part of your innate biology. And that's what's going to determine the way, the extent to which you may have to try and manage or override biology. Um, and that's really difficult to do, as we know. Uh, it may be that the protein target has evolved to follow a particular trajectory through your life and your life goals may be somewhere else and you may therefore need to manage your diet um, and, and fight to some degree or at least um, work um, constructively with your biology to the extent that you can to achieve those goals. Um, so that, that, this, that's really actually, if you unpack it, a, 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 a quite, it's a sophisticated question and it has a quite complex answer. Yeah. We've thought a lot about it. Actually. Mm. Yeah. And, of course, the target is not just with respect to protein but also fats and carbohydrates. Right. And, right. you know, as energy requirements go up, we've shown in um, animal studies both in the lab and in the field the spontaneously selected diet um, changes to track those increased energy demands. So monkeys, for example, in China in the winter when they have high metabolic costs for, for um, thermoregulation, for generating heat in the very cold winters, um, they select a diet during winter that's significantly and substantially higher in fats and carbohydrates because that is what the um, thermoregulation requires, but the same in relation to protein. Or well, it's the same in lactation. So appetite systems are calibrated according to, according to an animal's nutritional requirements. And that's an important indicator to us as humans because we can then ask the question in humans, as we've asked in many other species, what is the diet that our appetite systems spontaneously select in an appropriate environment, one that's not um, polluted by high levels of ultra-processed foods and things that our appetite systems are not adapted to dealing with. And invariably, that diet seems to be about 15 to 18 percent of energy from protein, um, at least to the extent that the nutritional geometry analysis have been done on these um, on that question. And that's a really important indicator as to what um, is the the, the natural or the required nutritional balance for humans. Yeah. And it, good that you brought up environment because I think that is so important. And you, and you, you devote a whole section in your book about environment and, and, and the environment that you both have withstood, whether it's, you know, the lab uh, counting all the, all the flies or being out in the field in the, in the, you know, plus hundred degree heat in the desert or high in the mountains and, the tracking these animals for days and weeks at a time. I mean, you've been through some crazy environments, but that's also part of where maybe the extrapolation to human data is maybe not as, as accurate because the environment we are in is a completely different environment with too much food, too much low quality food, um, kind of all around us. And a lot of the times the biological processes sort of break down and that's sort of a big part of the hypothesis that, that that's why it's driving obesity because of our environment. But then also, I guess I'm rambling a little bit, but also the, the concepts of satiety and the concepts of, of health that maybe protein plays an extra role there. So again, it's that, it's that balance based on the environment 
that you're in. So do you have a hard time sort of extrapolating the, the locus environment to human environments and, and with how different they are and saying that the protein leverage is equal among those situations? The thing about studying natural environments is it helps you to better understand, and in our case, it's not just humans, but more broadly, primates and other species, it helps you better understand those biological mechanisms and what sorts of environmental dynamics they evolved to deal with. If you then look back to our current environments, our biology hasn't changed, the environment has changed, we get a much clearer perspective on what's going wrong. Our biology isn't broken. Our biology is, is, is intimately, intricately capable like that of the other species that we study. What's changed is the environment in which that biology is interacting. And, and you're exactly right, Brett. The, the key point of interaction is between our evolved biology, including our appetite systems, our multiple nutrient appetites um, in particular, and our nutritional environment. And the good news story is that we're not in a mess because we've broken our biology. We've hacked our biology. We've distorted our biology. We've diverted our biology off course, but it's still working. And the reason we've done that is because we've changed, as David said, our food environment so radically um, that that biology is now no longer working for us as it evolved to do. It's now working for uh, the processed food industries um, and, in fact, um, countermanding our better health. So it, it's, that's the point where biology intersects uh, the nutritional environment and that's where all the action happens and that's where the solutions have to lie and the solution isn't to fix our broken biology. That still works. Our, our, the solution is to fix our broken food systems. Right, there are very yeah. few foods in nature that are designed specifically to be eaten. Most are designed not to be eaten. If you think of yeah, plants evolving not to be eaten, animals evolving not to be eaten. We've done, we've reversed that. And we've, we've, we've populated our nutritional, our food environments with foods that are specifically designed to be eaten and very cleverly and effectively designed to be eaten and to be eaten in large quantities. So our biology has come, has evolved to deal with resistance against being eaten by foods. And now it's like pushing on a wall that isn't there and you're bound to fall flat on your face because there is no resistance. Foods are, are beckoning to be eaten like we see nowhere else in the wild. Yeah, that, that's very well said. And it, it comes to the point of the environment, the politics, the lobbying, like with you know pizza being declared a vegetable and, and so forth, that you really are. We're sort of fighting an uphill battle um, with our biology sort of behind the wheel, but not really, because someone else has taken the wheel and that's the processed food company. So what do you see as the way out for us um, as, a, as a society, as a, as a world, um, when we've been diverted so deeply into this processed food industry, into the calories, into wanting pleasure from our food and now knowing where we can get that feeling of pleasure of food. And it's not from the healthy, nutrient-dense, low-calorie foods. So wh what do you see as a way out for us? Well, the short-term and the long-term um, uh, uh, approaches to dealing with that, the short-term and the immediate um, thing that all of us can do is we understand what is driving the problem. It's the way that highly processed foods are marketed and they're formulated and not to be compatible with our biology. So the short-term fix, and this is what all successful uh, weight loss or other healthy diets do is to cut out or minimize the contribution of highly processed industrial foods to our diets. And we can't do that. We can't regulate uh, or change um, in the short term our broader food environment, but our more our narrower, specific, personal food environment we can. And that's the environment that we surround, our, we create around ourselves such that we, when we're hungry, we choose foods to eat in our own homes. And so uh, the way that I think about it is to shop with your brain, reduce the amount of that stuff that gets into your house, and then eat with your appetites. In the longer term, it's a massive challenge. That's a societal challenge. All of the evidence suggests that not any, no single 
societal sector, like civil society, the individual or government or industry can fix these types of problems. It has to be a coalition, a collaboration, a broader societal collaboration. And there have been successful precedents. Tobacco is one example. Right. Excessive salt intake in some countries, salt intake, which is a major killer, as you all know, has been reduced significantly, specifically through initiatives that have involved all three of those sectors. So the short-term and long-term approaches. And I do believe tobacco at least provides a precedent that suggests there is hope for dealing with this thing, but we need to approach it in a specific way. It's a it's a problem of dealing with a, a complex system. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, we're sitting here in the Charles Perkins Centre. Uh, we've built this place precisely to do that. So, so that's where we're heading next. We're heading to an understanding of how to deal with the entire food system, how to intervene in multiple key places um, and how to drive change that actually can change the food environment in a way that supports our biology rather than um, it abrogates, um, diverts, um, undermines our biology. But that, we believe, that can be done in a way that also supports the food industry because people have to eat. So it's, it's not doing away with the food industry. It is just directing it in a way that's more compatible with health, environment, and also the economy. All three of those things are really important. And we've got to find the balance that, that, that better achieves an overall balance between um, economic health and environmental outcomes. And that's an ecological problem. A food system is a, 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 an ecosystem so would you say your research now is focusing less on the, the biology and more on the environment and the intervention and the solutions, or are you still doing a mix of both? Very much a mix of both. A mix of both, yeah. 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 And it's really important to understand the biology in the context of the broader system, and at the same time understanding the broader system is very important for directing the biological research. So it really is broadening and expanding the program. So yeah. to do that, um, here we, we, we've got everybody from philosophers and historians and playwrights and novelists to basic biomedical scientists, clinicians. We treat patients in, in the building. We, we've harvested the many disciplines that you find in a, a major comprehensive university like the University of Sydney, and we've brought them together in these, um, in these new combinations that allow... The story that emerged in in the book where a couple of bug biologists have ended up um, having insights into a a global human health issue, we're we're trying to build upon that um, that way of thinking um, and that experience. And are you doing more studies now in humans? Because, I mean, I know you you went into detail about how difficult it was to do this five-year study on mice and it was like so, it was right. it was so laborious and it makes you think that doing studies on humans would be almost impossible to that same degree so as you transition from from you know bugs and mice to humans what do you see as some of the challenges to get equally good science and equally reliable science that you're doing now? Well, some of the experimental um, studies, the clinical trials and, and those sorts of studies, we, we are involved um, with quite a lot of them. Um, by necessity, they're, they're involving fewer um, treatments, dietary interventions. You can't run 33 diets um, over a, an extended period in, in humans. That's just practically impossible to do. Uh, and, of course, they can't run for the same duration. You can't set up a, life, a lifetime study which takes people through to the end of their lives decades later for all sorts of reasons, including ethical ones. Um, so what we're doing, and another really important part of what we're trying to do, is develop frameworks for um, data conciliation, if you like, ways of using data that come from population level studies, epidemiological studies, um, experimental studies, comparative studies from other species, and bring them together within the same um, conceptual framework, and that is provided by nutritional geometry. And that's a very that's a powerful way of taking advantage of what's out there without for example, saying, no, no, we can't deal with epidemiological data because um, it's flawed. 
Um, oh, no, a clinical study is never long enough. We can't really put any weight on that. There's a lot of naysaying around particular approaches, but if you bring them together within a common framework, they can actually support one another um, and the pieces together form a, a much stronger overarching story. And we've used protein leverage as a way to do that, um, seeking evidence um, in many different realms and in many different um, styles of experimental approach or population approaches, and, and they're all coming together to say the same thing. And that, that, that's powerfully um, supportive of the original hypothesis. And it's yeah. very similar to the approach that we've taken for decades in relation to non-human species, where um, both lab studies and studies in, in the wild have their strengths and weaknesses. But the gold standard is to bring them together, mm. the combined strengths, and that compensates for the combined weaknesses, the separate weaknesses. And that's the approach we're now taking to human nutrition. Do you miss being out there in the wild and stalking the orangutans through the mountains or stalking the locusts through the desert and the, the elements and just being out in nature? Or do, you, do you miss that part? Is this a, a reference to COVID? Or? <laughs> COVID's COVID's, COVID has slowed it, yes, indeed. Um, uh, luckily, uh, my last trip was a very... Um, exciting and um, eye-opening one, and a very intense one. It was to the, um, the Congo Basin to spend a month with a group of um, foraging, uh, a foraging society, the um, Bayaka and Benjili um, hunter-gatherers in the Congo. And um, I think that trip will last me for probably another year until I can get out into the wild again. <laughs> it's like you, la you lasted that trip, David. I lasted so. it. And, I'm, <laughs> and it's challenging. I'm relieved, yeah. Oh, well, it's great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It, it's been really fun uh, discussing this with you. And I'm a big fan of your book. I highly recommend it to everybody and, of course, all your research. If you were to direct people where they can learn more about you, um, I know you're on Twitter and so forth. So where, where would you tell them to go? Where's the best places to find you? I guess initially to read the book, um, we we there's another book we wrote in 2012 called The Nature of Nutrition, which is worthwhile reading as well. It's a it's it's more academic and more detailed than Eat Like the Animals. But if you want a a single place where a lot of the ideas, certainly to that point, are brought together. In a, in, a, in a reasonably accessible way, then that's a good start. So The Nature of Nutrition, Princeton University Press, published in 2012. Um, but, no, we're on, you can find the Charles Perkins Centre online. You can find us um, online as well, easily. Very good. Well, thank you both. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for all the work you do. And I look forward to seeing your upcoming publications. Thanks thank very you, much, Brett. Brett.